Welcome to the Learning Curve, the podcast for parents and educators, where we discuss positive parenting and supporting your child on their learning journey. As parents, we all want to provide the best possible environment for our children to learn and grow. But with so much information out there, it can be overwhelming to know where to start. In this podcast, we will explore practical tips and strategies for promoting positive parenting practices that can help your child thrive. From building strong relationships to fostering independence, we will cover a range of topics that will help you support your child's learning journey and promote their overall well-being. Join us each week as we interview experts in the field, share real-life stories from parents just like you, and provide actionable advice to help you navigate the challenges of parenting in today's world. Whether you are a new parent or have been parenting for years, we believe that every parent can benefit from a little extra support and encouragement along the way. So let's get started on this journey of positive parenting and supporting our children's learning together. Hi, today we have a special guest and her name is Karine Mosa. Who is she? Well, she is a renowned special needs parent coach and the founder of It Takes a Village Special Needs Parent Coaching, LLC. Kareen holds a degree in elementary education and psychology from Southern Connecticut State University, as well as a master's degree in communications from New York University Stanford School of Education. Right During her tenure at Hill Central Music Academy in New Haven, Connecticut, Karine was awarded the prestigious title of Teacher of the Year, a testament to her dedication to her profession. Karine is also a wife and a mother of two children, one of whom has a rare seizure disorder called Dravet Syndrome, as well as global developmental delay and autism spectrum disorder. Her personal experiences raising a child with special needs led her to start it Takes a Village Special Needs Parent Coaching in 2023. Service is to aim at helping parents navigate often challenging journey of special needs parenting. Her coaching services have been highly praised by parents who appreciate her compassionate and practical approach to special needs parenting. Now let's dive further in to get to know more about Kareen. All right. Hi everyone and hi all the listeners. Welcome to our next episode of the learning curve with luck Y, and today i have karim mosa and karim mosa is a renowned special needs parent coach and founder of it takes a village special needs parent coaching llc so she appears in our previous episode as well talking about navigating challenges of special needs parenthood and if you want to know more about taking care and nurturing special needs child do refer back to our previous episode as for today we are going to talk about how we mature the siblings, the common emotions and reactions that typically develop among the siblings that the sibling have to go through when growing up alongside with a special need brother or sister. So Karin, can you share with us more? Like how do you mature and take care of the other sibling? In this yeah, case? well, first of all, thank you so much for having me back. It was so much fun talking with you last time. So I'm thrilled to be back and sharing with your listeners again. As we were talking about earlier, you know, in raising both of my children, I have two children, my son who is 11 and has a seizure disorder, global developmental delays, autism spectrum disorder. And then I have a typically developing daughter who's nine. As she's growing, it's gotten me thinking about how is this all really affecting her? You know, I think that when she was little, it was easier. She just kind of went with the flow and just kind of like joined in with the family. But as she's getting older, I'm seeing how having a brother with very complex medical needs, special needs is affecting her. And so it just got me thinking and I published a blog a a little while back about how to nurture your typically developing child living in a special needs world. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm happy to share that because I think it's something that we don't often talk about. You do hear a lot of tips for parents of children with with special needs and how to take care of the special needs child, or even how to take care of yourself as the parent. But we don't really often hear a lot about the siblings. And it has a very profound effect on their life as well. So hopefully we'll get some good tips across today and really just raise awareness uh, that people need that you do need to be thinking about this as well 
I do agree. Everywhere, even on social media or, or TV and radio, everybody is talking about how to take care of a special need child and how to take care of yourself as a parent. But a lot of times, a lot of parents are also wondering, how can I take care of the other sibling? How can I make sure the sibling is well t- taken care of mentally, emotionally, and things like that? So yeah. as a mom of two, in your case, what are the tips and and guidance that you can give to the parents out there with more than one child? Yeah, I think that the biggest tip, the biggest takeaway, if you take nothing else away from this episode today, it's to be authentic and be transparent and be accountable for the day-to-day with your child, with your typically developing child. And what I mean by that is just being intentional. Like it's so easy to go through the day-to-day motions and your typically developing child is usually your easy one and you just kind of aren't thinking. And I think is to make sure that you do stop and think about how is my parenting of my typical child potentially affecting him or her? Because it's just very easy to get lost in the shuffle and the day-to-day and not stop to think about what we're doing and how it might be affecting our child. I touch on this in, in the blog as well, so feel free to check out the blog. But from a developmental psychology perspective, there's certain things that children need in order to grow and thrive psychologically. They need to have um, a secure and nurturing environment. They need to have responsive caregivers They need to have opportunities for exploration and learning, social interactions. Um, They need to have routines and then also like a sense of autonomy. And so when thinking about that, you need that certainly your special needs child needs those things, right? Of course, they need responsive caregivers. They need a secure and nurturing environment. And so what I started to think about is how am I addressing each of those developmental needs for my daughter? And there's certain areas when upon reflection, I was like, I'm not really doing a great job of being super intentional all the time. There's certain things in each of those areas that we could do just to make sure that we're doing everything we can. Parenting is not easy. No one's going to do it perfectly. We're all going to mess up a million times along the way. But if you are being intentional with what you're trying to do, you're already winning with that. I agree. Being intentional, even though without, with or without a special need child, we always have to be intentional with what we are doing and be authentic. And also like what you have mentioned, always stop and reflect, am I doing the right thing? Mm-hmm. Of course, we may not know whether it's right or wrong since we don't have the answer sheet to parenting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at least know and understand how you are doing, what you're doing and how is it affecting your child or your children. Yeah. But we I also have to keep track. Such an, it's such an important thing that you just said that We don't know what we're doing right or wrong a lot of the time. And I think I take that for granted because I was an elementary school teacher and I did study psychology in in school. And so I feel like a lot of the times there are things that I know I should be doing because of my background and still not doing them. But then I do find with the parents that I'm working with in coaching, they don't know those things because they don't have a background in teaching or psychology. And so it's even harder to know that, oh, I might be making a mistake and the stakes are high. And I was saying before that I often refer to this as an AP parenting or advanced placement parenting. When you have a child with special needs or complex medical needs, not only is it scary and not only do you come into it completely unprepared, but you are at that advanced level of parenting by no choice of your own. So just like when you're in high school, if you're in an honors or an AP class, it can be hard, but you have to rise to the occasion. And it's the same thing with parenting a child with special needs or medical difficulties is you don't have a choice and you have to rise to the occasion. And so looking at that, I'm coaching parents on that and looking at it myself. And I've kind of come up with in each of those developmental um, categories that I mentioned before, just things that we can do one or two things in each of those categories that we can just reflect on and think, am I doing this? Should I fix that? It's just helpful to have kind of like a little guide to go by. Right. It's true. And sometimes you're like so lost when you're so busy and so frustrated, you don't know what to do. Right. So if there's a guide for them to look through and, and look at it and to follow, it'll be Mm -hmm. so good to guide them. 
Yeah, absolutely. As far as a guide and the tips on what to do, I would say that in each of those categories that I talked about, so for example, having a secure and nurturing environment, what could you do in that category to make sure that your typically developing child is okay? Be secure and nurturing, right? So ask them about how do they feel? A lot of times our typical kids don't want to tell us how they're feeling because they don't want to add one more thing for us to be worried about or stressed about or upset about. And so they keep it in. And then that's going to do a lot of damage when they're grown up, <laughs> keeping in those kinds of feelings. So you want to encourage them to talk to you and tell you what they're feeling. You might be surprised by what they tell you or by their misconceptions, things that they think that aren't happening. And so just creating that environment for them where they do feel secure and they do feel nurtured. It's just as simple as at bedtime or on the way to school, having a little conversation, a check-in with them. How are you feeling? I think that's just a simple way to uh, kind of address that. I do agree. And it's and like what you mentioned earlier in the beginning, it, it's easier to handle kids when they are younger. Yes. But as they grow older, mm -hmm. they tend to have a different thoughts. For example, the case of my friend who has an older si sister mm -hmm. who is special need. And now that she's growing older, she's always wondering, why do I have to take care of my sister? I have so much things on my plate. So as a parent, how do you handle this kind of unfairness thinking in the child on their yeah, own? It's such a hard balance to being part of a family comes with responsibilities and it comes with taking care of each other. And you don't get to pick who your family is and you don't get to pick what needs come up. Things can happen anytime and life can change. And so it's just as the parent being aware of not making your typical child your third parent, or if you're a single parent, the second parent, it's about giving them some responsibility because that's part of being in a family, but also balancing that with, do I really need my child to be doing this for me right now? Or could I get up off the couch and do it myself? <laughs> you know, and, and of course, a lot of times we're exhausted. And sometimes the answer is no, I cannot get up off the couch right now. And she's nine and has a lot of energy. And I'm going to send her upstairs to go get whatever it is I need, you know, but it's just again, being aware of that balance. I don't think that the child should have no responsibility for their sibling. I think that that's part of being a community member and loving your family and loving your sibling and learning that this is what they need. This is real life. But again, balancing it, not overdoing it and depending on your child too much, because again, they are a child. So that kind of goes into the second category, which is having responsive caregivers. When you have a child with special needs, whether it's behavioral outbursts that they may be having or medical scares, things like that, of course, the parents are responsive to that. We're so over responsive to the child that has the condition. But are we responsive to the typical child too? When the typical child has a behavior outburst, are they getting punished? Are they immediately going to time out? Are they grounded? Or are we taking time to sit with them and say, hey, as the adult who can regulate their emotions, <laughs> ideally, right? Can we sit with them and say, hey, what is going on? What are you feeling? Why are you acting out? Because chances are it has something to do with something going on in the home, right? The reason they're acting that way. They feel jealous of the attention that their sibling is getting. They feel frustrated that they're not able to go, you know, to some big community event because the sibling can't go or whatever it might be. There's a lot of feelings I think that they carry with them that sometimes turn into outbursts or negative behavior. And so being a responsive caregiver to both children is crucial and just something to, to be aware of. Yeah. And it's not easy when the normal child feel unfair. I can't do certain things because of someone else. Right. Or I need to do certain things because of someone else. Yeah. Yep. So that, that kind of mental is a lot to hold it is. for the child. And even for an adult, I mean, sometimes as the parent, I'm like, this stinks. Like, I want to go do things. I can't do a lot of things because of our situation. But at the end of the day, that's adulthood. And our job as parents is to prepare the children for adulthood. And adulthood is not doing what you want all the time, carefree, 
and just living your best life. Like we see that on social media, but it's not true. We're not all out here living our best lives. We're all struggling with different things. And if we're not right now, we will be later. And as much as I feel for my daughter, I'm also really happy for her in a way that she's having this dose of reality at a young age. Because when you grow up and everything is perfect all the time, and then you become an adult and things are not perfect, then that causes a lot of inner turmoil as well. And so it's just perspective. It's keeping a positive perspective for yourself and your child. And I choose to look at it that way most days that I think that this is good for her in the long run, especially if I could be intentional about how I'm addressing her needs. And with this kind of situation, they get to learn more layers when they're growing up. They get to experience more layers of life compared yeah. to other kids. Yeah. But for yourself, do you feel unbalanced on the some days where, oh, am I giving too much attention to the special need child or am I unfair to the other child? Yeah, every day. <laughs> every day I worry about that and I wonder about that. The thing when you have a child with special needs, especially my son, you know, has developmental delays and, you know, seizures and behavior issues, but he's mobile and he gets around and he causes a lot of trouble. <laughs> he likes mischief. <laughs> he gets into a lot of mischief. And so he demands my attention. I have got to pay attention to him because he's going to do damage. He's going to get himself hurt. He's going to do something bad in the house. So he just demands my attention. Whereas my daughter could be in her room playing games or doing homework or whatever for hours and she's quiet and she's not demanding my attention. So it's much easier to focus on the one that is hanging from the chandelier and ignore the one that's quiet in her room doing what she's supposed to be doing. I do try to think about that and be aware of that. And then it's just planning one-on-one -on -one time for her. It's being really intentional about, hey, listen, I will say to my husband, you stay home with our son today. I'm going to take her out and we're just going to go do a mommy and daughter thing. It doesn't even have to be a big expensive to do, but like just to go to the library or go for a hike. She loves going for a hike. So it's just being really intentional is the theme, but being intentional about spending that time with her, um, which really helps to address a lot of these other developmental needs that she has for the responsive parent and the secure environment. And also opportunities for exploration and learning is, is another one. And I try to offer her that in a lot of different ways by nurturing her own interests. That goes into one of the other areas, which is developing a sense of autonomy. I try to push her into different activities and different things to do so that she can develop her own unique identity. I don't want her identity to be her brother or sister. I want her identity to be who she is. And well, yes, a big part of that is growing up in a household that is chaos a lot of the times and lots of drama and lots of special needs. The girl has seen seizures in her brother since she was born. That's not normal to see that kind of stress and tension and all of that. So by taking her out and doing things with her and giving her those, you know, exploration time and things like that, it really helps to foster that need for her. I try to be very aware. And I give her the same with my husband. She goes on dates with my husband and they do things to try to give her that one-on-one -on -one time. I like that. I think mean, even for normal kids, it's like we also have to do one-on-one -on -one with each of them. A hundred percent. So that they feel more balanced. I like the part that you mentioned about having her own identity. That is so, so important rather than having the identity that my mom wants or my dad yes. wants. A hundred percent. And you know that it, in some cases, it would be nice if when she grows up, she decides she does want to be an advocate for her brother. She decides that she wow. does want to spread the word about his condition and maybe hold fundraisers or lobby Congress about medications, whatever it might be. Like, that would be beautiful. But I don't expect it. And if she doesn't want to, that's her prerogative. I want her to grow up to be who she came here to be. That's my goal is to nurture her to get there and to reach her full potential. That sense of autonomy is big when it comes to, it's big for every child, but especially when you're in a situation where you have a sibling with some special needs.
Then the last mm-hmm. one, talking about the developmental needs, is that need for a consistent routine. And I'm sure you talk about that a lot with just typical kids. The yeah. need for a routine. They need to know what to expect. They need to know what's happening that day. It helps manage behaviors. It helps manage anxiety, even more so when there's a child with special needs or complex medical needs in the household. What do we do when her brother has a big outburst and we're out in public? How do we handle that as a family? What do we do? If he has a seizure somewhere, home or out, how do we handle that? What do we do? And I think having routines around the specific things that happen to your special needs sibling is crucial as well, because there can be a lot of anxiety that comes from dealing with this as a child just letting her know that as her parents like we've got this we will take care of it here's how you can assist here's your role when this happens having those kind of parameters for her is very important in dealing with both the unexpected kind of emergencies that happen but then also just the day because getting ready in the morning she can be autonomous on that we are still getting her brother ready as if he's two, we're doing all the things for him. So letting her know just her typical day to day routine, what that should look like and what she's responsible for having those clear expectations is really important. She will feel like "Mm, I'm responsible for this. Yeah, she feels like she's part of the family as well. That's right. That's my goal. I want her to feel a sense of ownership about her role in our family and that she's a really important part of our family. And also her role, her responsibility for herself and taking care of herself and that she can do hard things. I tell her that all the time. You can do hard things in the long run. If I do it right, which the jury is still out, I don't know how this is all going to turn out, but it will be good for her as she grows into an adult. So that's my goal. Definitely. And I think that she's more mature than any other kids of her own age. Absolutely. Have you encountered any moments where, or any situation where she doesn't know how to express herself and you're trying to figure out what's going on? Luckily, she's very expressive. And it might be because I've tried to be aware of that since she was little. So we've always kind of had an open dialogue. As she's getting older, though, I am noticing a little bit of a change. You know, she's becoming a tween. She'll be 10 in a couple of months. And I'm starting to notice that she's kind of taking things more on herself. You know, she's not a baby anymore. She's not a toddler or a preschooler. Like she's, she's growing, but it's something that I'm having to be even more aware of now. And I think that's the trick of parenting is that just when you think you've got it, they change. <laughs> yes, so, I totally agree on that. Yeah. So there's never really a time where you're like, I've got this, you know, now I feel like I'm watching and I'm like, is she okay? Like what's happening? You know, because she's changing right in front of my eyes. That's it's what they do. And so again, all I can do as her parent is just be aware and try to have open lines of communication and try to be aware of these different developmental needs that she has and do my best. <laughs> I agree, yeah. And having built that foundation is so important, the open conversation. And not until when you notice something is not correct or something is off, then you start doing it. It's hard, harder to solve in a way. Absolutely. So much harder because there's all of that, all those layers that have built up that you have to kind of peel through. So yeah, definitely easier to be open and transparent about what's happening at the beginning as opposed to backtracking later yeah i really takes my head off you like handling so many things at one time and still be able to con- be conscious and aware and intentional about your parenting as well because as a normal parent <laughs> mm-hmm. it's already very hard especially mm-hmm. when it comes to like being intentional being conscious because sometimes when your day is so packed with so many things you mm-hmm. tend to forget Absolutely. Forget about consciousness. You forget about intention. Yeah. You just want to get things done and you're just <clears throat> screaming around. Yeah. That's, I think, 90% of the time for all of us, right? It's just, and it's something to just keep in mind that this is the ideal. It's the same thing with like, you know, eating right and exercising. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And I try to do that. of the time. Do I make it every day? No. It's just about being aware and trying to build in better choices 
more intention where we can. It's not about being perfect because that is a terrible goal to set for yourself in this stressful world. (laughs) So it's just about being aware. And because like you said before, some people just don't even know that this is something to be thinking about by no fault Mm -hmm. of their own. They just weren't taught this stuff. And because kids don't come with a handbook. And so when you know, oh, my kids have like psychological developmental needs, geez, what am I doing in each of these areas? And just the next time a moment comes in front of you, you can maybe stop and think, oh, maybe I'll say this instead. Maybe instead of time out, I'm going to sit with my child and get down on their level and hold them and ask them what's wrong instead of just reacting, which is very normal. (laughs) It's very normal. It's what we all do. I'm certainly not coming here saying these are all of the The things that I do as a parent every single time because I'm doing it all right. Like, absolutely not. I know that these are things I need to be thinking of, which is what inspired me to write the blog and and address this with my coaching clients as well. So, yeah, I like the blog. It's it's simple and easy to understand and it's really meaningful for parents, especially. I'll be sharing your blog URL blog on on the show notes and hopefully parents who are listening able to go to your blog and have a read. So if they have any questions, they can go to you and ask more questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. But before we wrap up, is okay. there anything else you would like to share with our listeners, like particularly like those who might be in the midst of raising a family with both special needs and a typical developing child? I would say the only thing, and this might be the most important thing, is to seek out support. For your typical child, whether that be counseling, whether that be um, a sibling support group, time spent with other family members that don't have these needs going on in their house. I think giving your child support from someone other than yourself is really helpful. I recently brought my daughter to the group in our local area called Special Siblings, and it's four siblings of children with special needs to just go and chat and talk about their difficulties with people, with other kids who get it. And the thing that I loved about that is the kids at that meeting were all ages. They were maybe six years old up to 16. For my daughter to see younger kids dealing with it and even older kids and how she can kind of picture herself in that 16 year old girl and think, oh, wow, like, She's been doing this this whole time and look at her like she's a teenager and she's cool. And my daughter's fascinated with teenagers. So being able to see that it's not just her, it's not just your child that's dealing with this. I think that's really important because as we know, kids, teens, the most influential people in their lives are their friends and the people that they surround themselves with. So I can talk to her about all of her psychological developmental needs as much as I want to. But at the end of the day, it's the other people in her village that are going to really have that impact on her. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that would be my, my last bit of advice is to seek help. You know, there's, there's no shame in saying, Hey, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to deal with this. You're a professional. Can you help? Or this is a group for kids in my child's situation. Can they help? Just look for help. I think it's a noble thing to do. And again, advanced placement parenting. When you are in an AP class, you get a tutor. (laughs) And so it's the same thing. Like you cannot do this by yourself. You need to seek out support and build your build your village. I agree. And even though it's just a motherhood, it's already very lonely. So yeah. having finding a group that having the same situation as you, you know that you're not alone. Right. Yeah. And having that feeling of you're not alone, it's already very comforting. And you know that you can have someone to turn to if you need any help. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a basic need. Like we are community based, we're a community based species. Yeah. Humans need to feel connection. And you're right. It's so isolating when you're in this situation that finding that connection maybe in atypical places can just make all the difference. Yeah. So agree on that. Oh yeah. my gosh. Thank you, Karine, for sharing so You're much welcome. with us, especially oh, for pleasure. parents. I think because this topic is very rarely touched on 
And I think a lot of parents are also looking for help. And where can they find the help? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And knowing that you have your community to help them, I think that will create a lot of comfort and a lot of like not so lonely moments for them as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. 100%. So, so, for, <laughs> so for the listeners here, so if you need more help, you have questions to ask and you need support, do feel free to look for Karim Mosa. I'll be sharing her, her blog and her link to her website on my show notes as well. So thank you, Karin, for sharing so much with us and sh- sharing all your nuggets with the parents out there. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me back. It was great to see you. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for listening in. And I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to The Learning Curve, the podcast for parents and educators. We hope you found out today's episode helpful in supporting your positive parenting journey and your child's learning and development. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform so you would never miss an episode. And if you found value in what you heard, we would appreciate it if you could leave us a rating and a review. This helps us reach more parents like you who could benefit from our content. We also want to hear from you if you have any questions, comments or feedback. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us through our website or social media channels. We are here to support you on your parenting journey and are always happy to hear from our listeners. Thank you again for listening and we look forward to sharing more valuable insights and strategies with you in our next episode.